This is the Microsoft Cloud Show, episode 111, where we're going to geek out on some latest cloud news and talk about the NG Office UI fabric, recorded live January 13th, 2016. Welcome to the Microsoft Cloud Show, the only place to stay up to date on everything going on in the Microsoft Cloud world, including Windows Azure, Office 365, SharePoint, Exchange, Link, and related technologies. Just the information, no marketing, no BS. I'm Chris Johnson. And I'm Andrew Call. And we're just two dudes telling you how we see it. Good morning. Good morning, CJ. How are you? Pretty sweet. How about you? I'm doing great. Man, 111 episodes. This is crazy. I know. Still pinch myself. Who'd have thunk? Not me. I know. <laughs> it's incredible, isn't it? I, I love it. Anyway, what's been going on in your world? Uh, the whole second half of the show that we'll talk about. but uh... Excellent. Some exciting news. We've got some news to get through. We've got some picks. We're going to talk about a, a nice project that you've been working on and a few things like that. So hopefully uh, we're going to be a dev-heavy show today, I think. There's going to be a bunch of dev topics. Works for me. Yeah, it's uh, lately, I say, what is it? So I have been living the world of flying drones the last uh, recently, man. It, it is a lot of fun and it's cheap. It can be really expensive, but it's cheap. Yeah. I suspect it's one of those things, like, for me at least, it'd be I'd start off cheap, and next thing I'd be trying to justify, like, a $4,000 drone purchase. Oh, it's (laughs) – I can speak from experience. I have not gone that far yet, but I I was – we have, like, I have, like, a little $40 drone for people who are into drones. It's a SEMA X5C. My son has one, too. And they're, like, $45, $50. bucks, and um, we flew way, way high uh, in the neighborhood recently, and – the video you, we got and everything is a lot of fun. We did. We were we were brave. We tried to fly it when the winds picked up. We both put it in a tree. Thankfully, the tree was like maybe only fifteen feet up, but we were, so we were both able to get our drones out of the trees without any damage. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's man, it's a lot of fun. Of course, what do we do? We came home and over lunch we got out my iPad and we were on YouTube. And we were looking at octocopters with return to home GPS positioning, maintain station. Uh, waypoints, my God, it was... That's cool. Oh, my God, it's a, it's a really cool thing you can get into. It, definitely very expensive, but it does not take much to get into it just to play. Fun thing to do with the kids, too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Nice. Very nice. How about you? What have you been up to? Oh, a uh, bunch of work. Uh, we're really getting into things here and, and trying to make some decent progress towards the end of Jan. So um, it's all hands on deck and, uh, and yeah, getting stuck into it. So it's it's really fun. I've also been in the evenings pottering away on a little side project on the couch ah. that I'll, that we'll talk about in a sec. Well, why I'm doing it at least we'll talk about in a sec. But uh, it's fun. I'm playing around with um, the webhooks in Office 365, so to be notified when things in your inbox change and um, and doing that all in Node and and Docker and and uh, geeking out on that. So yeah, more to come on that. But it's um fun little uh exercise awesome man awesome yeah it sounds like sounds fun so you want to guess what do you want to do first you want to do news yeah let's jump into some news i can kick things off with sharegate helps google apps users jump to office 365 Ah. so sharegate is a partner organization that's very popular in the office 365 world for i think they're probably best known for migration of content into sharepoint and office 365 and very easy tool to use and great bunch of guys that run the business and um, really great little tool. So they've announced that um, they're able to suck data out of uh, Google Drive now and um, and get it into Office 365, which is, uh, which is kind of nice. I guess Microsoft would be pretty stoked about this for customers that want to switch and um, – make it super easy for them so um kind of an extension of what they what they were already doing but uh but sort of taking the next step in in another content source with google drive absolutely yeah that's a it was a nice very nice improvement that they've uh they've added me it helps them with people that want to do the migrations from coming from google drive over to 365 yeah exactly yeah and um so we'll see. We'll see if they start adding other sources. I suspect Box will probably be one at some stage. Who knows? I mean, I know nothing about that, but hey, that'd be kind of cool. Mm. Apparently, there's lots of I, from. Uh, I guess they're biased sources, but from people I talk to, there's there's starting to be a bunch of big Box customers that are um, that are getting fed up and and uh, and switching to three six five. So um, mm. maybe uh, there's a decent migration business in Box to three six five there. So. We'll see if they make moves in that regard. Interesting. Very interesting. Yes. I think we will see some box migration and wins 
to Office 365 news in the next few months. Let's put it that way. Mm, that'll be interesting to watch. Very interesting to watch. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's the first bit of news. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so I have this another article that I found. I actually found it last week, but I decided not to put it on the show, uh, talk about it on the show, because I wanted to spend a little more time talking about it with you and while we were doing our whole predictions and review stuff or wishes for next year. So this article is by a gentleman by the name of Zach Bjornsson, and it's the only post he has on his blog. So he talks about having additional posts, but I'm curious to see where he goes with this. This is one of those posts that we see, you see these pop up, it seems like every few weeks between people comparing different aspects of um, the different clouds that are out there. What's nice about this, though, is it's not from a, uh, like an analyst, this is from an individual. So this, this guy's building a new cloud product, and it's that's going to need to quickly process large amounts of scientific data. And their biggest customer data set is about 3000 tables, each 40 to 80 megs, totaling about 150 gigs. So they want to be able to process this at 10 seconds or less. So what they needed to do is they need to spend some time figuring out what's going to be the best cloud. And they looked at AWS, specifically S3. They looked at Google Cloud and Azure. And they look at it from the, the aspect of um, cloud storage performance. Now, I'm not going to go through the entire article here. But what he does is he basically looks at two different metrics. Uh, one is the time to the first byte of reading the first byte. And then the other one is what's the total throughput download. And uh, he does this by doing a couple checks using different uh, virtual machines in the different the three different clouds and looking at some of the advantages. And with something Google has actually introduced in their cloud called multi-region buckets. So the his findings kind of concluded that the best performance that he was seeing as far as like time to first byte was coming from kind of between almost a tie between both Azure and AWS. Um, Google was much slower on time to first byte. So Essentially, if you're doing small files, it seems like Azure and AWS are really going to win out. But when he looked at the total throughput download, uh, it was really surprising to see the difference between the, the three different players. Yeah, You saw Azure was by far the slowest. I mean, and we're talking, when I say the slowest, when we look at like, say, it's on a measure of anywhere from like, say, Azure was pulling down about 20 megs a second or, or up to 27 megs a second, where Google was maxing out any, around 100, anywhere from 67 to 122. So you're seeing a significant difference, almost threefold, three, anywhere from three to sixfold um, difference in speed between uh, Google and Azure. Now, the difference here is obviously going to be, you know, it depends on what kind of files you're looking at and pulling them down from your own cloud. When I say pulling them down, it's I have a VM that lives inside of one of these clouds and it's asset, accessing the storage data that lives in the storage uh, resource, whatever each one of the different partners calls it. So for Azure, we would say, yep. I got a VM and that's going to access um, the storage blobs. And AWS is going to be an EC2 VM that lives in the S and the data lives in S3. It shows that if you're going for small amounts of data or small, not small amounts, but small fragments of data, not big files, Time to first byte is important, yep. and that's going to really favor Azure and AWS. Hmm. But if you've got really big files, it's your, over time, while Google's going to lose at the very beginning of pulling that file, it's going to win out by a significant margin, finish much, much faster. It's a fascinating article because he's got a ton of charts and a ton of detail that he's gone through and a lot of graphs and stuff. So if you're if it's interesting for your project, uh, definitely go check it out. we got it pinned in our Flipboard that you can go take a look at. Yeah, it's a pretty cool report. And um They've got some nice conclusions at the end, sort of nicely summarized and things. And uh, it's kind of interesting to see, yeah, the AWS and Azure and and Google being paired up side by side and and, uh, a little bit of a bake-off. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. That's nice. I've got another piece of news. Build registration opens on January the 19th at 9 a.m. Pacific time. What? Did that just hit? Yeah. it just I saw the tweet come through from uh, Steve Guggenheimer from Microsoft, who sort of leads the DPE um, developer and platform evangelism uh, group at Microsoft and said that they just put out a blog post and said that Build Ridge will open on Jan 19th. So, um, ah, very cool. This will come out, I think... This podcast will come out just in just in time. It'll come out the same morning that build registration opens. So, <laughs> so by the time you so hear it, stop <laughs> listening and hurry up and register. <laughs> yeah, it depends on uh, depends on when it opens. It opens up at say nine a.m. Pacific. Nine a.m. Pacific. Yeah. So uh, we go live at ten a.m. East Coast. So that's seven a.m. So if you listen to this right when we come out, you've got about two hours. 
before to get ready because this thing's going to sell out usually in another like 15, 20, 30 minutes or something like that. Okay, please don't leave us. Please, please don't leave us. No, pl- <laughs> there's plenty of time to listen to the show. Plenty of time. That's right. <laughs> so chances are if you're only just getting to build registration now, you've probably missed it. It's probably full. So don't. Yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening to this on your commute home, I hate to break the news to you, but you're screwed. Yeah, exactly. No, really. Uh, so I've got another piece of news. Happy New Year, EC2 price reductions. So Amazon is doing some price war negotiations. I guess not negotiations, uh, announcements. And they're making some um, yet, or they're saying, we're making yet another EC2 price reduction. So they're reducing the on-demand and reserved instance dedicated hosting prices for C4 and M4 instances running Linux by 5%. Mm. And various different regions. It's specific to particular regions. And then the same again for R3 instances by 5% in certain regions as well. And... um, yeah, so the uh, the price wars continue on to compute by the looks of it. Mm. Yeah, I see that Amazon also released their email and calendar, calendaring service. They call it uh, Amazon Workmail. Um, that's now in GA. It exited preview. So that's kind of their competing hosted exchange option that Office 365 has. Yeah, I, I think I tweeted about this when, um, when the news came out, and uh, we put it in Flipboard, obviously. This is going to be really interesting to see if they make any traction against Office 365 and Google Apps because it's kind of uh, very far third place, Yeah, probably even like fifth or sixth place. So it'll be interesting to see where they get to. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how far they get with it. I'm not sure where they're at right now, but at least they're in GA, so we'll see. I had uh, two really quick ones that we've got here. We've got three quick little Azure ones, and I guess we can kind of dive into our picks and then talk about the meat of the show. You want to do that? Sounds good. Okay, so the three Azure quick picks or quick ones we got here is that, number one, static public IP addresses are now available for Azure VMs. As far as Azure Search goes, there's a new Search Explorer uh, that you can use. It's in the Azure Search Blade in the portal. It allows you to you know, build query strings, issue search queries, and stuff like that. And then there was also an update um, on the Azure Dev Test VM um, service that they have. You can now have a choice to choose from just standard storage for your VM, or you can even choose SSDs uh, if you want to have blazingly fast VMs that you just spin up to do a little bit of testing and then have them spin back down. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. So why don't you tell us about your little pet project that you were uh, talking about, and or do you want to do picks first? Well, it's kind of related. My pick is kind of related to that. So Okay. Why don't you tell us about the project and then throw the pick in? Yeah. So... The Office team, the Office 365 team, are running a hackathon. And um, you can go and find out about this up on dev.office.com forward slash hackathons, I think it is. But um, it's being run by the hackathons being facilitated through uh, DevPost, I believe. And so there's some pretty cool prizes. Uh, I think first prize is 10 grand. Something like that. Mm. It's pretty uh, pretty decent. And then there's a whole bunch of others as well. So definitely go check that out. But basically, in a nutshell, you've got to build an app. There's a few different categories. Um, it's called Hack Productivity is the name of the hackathon. And you can uh, go build an Office add-in, use Office 365 APIs, the Microsoft Graph, Photos, Files, Calendar, uh, Contacts, things like that. And so I've been, for some time, I've been after a, I've been after a solution to my task problem of super simply creating tasks in Outlook and having them flow to Wonderlist. And so um, I've been sort of just hacking around a little sample project to um, to try and wire that up. And uh, and I might I might enter it into the hackathon. We'll see. Ah, oh, cool. We'll see if I get it done in time. The hackathon runs until the end of February, I think. End, sorry, yeah, first of March is um, the last day to submit. Hmm. So. Um, Grand prize ten k in cash, second prize five k, uh, third prize twenty five hundred, and then it goes on for various different prizes beyond that. So there's some some nice uh, some nice prizes. There's a there's a fair amount of interest in the hackathon. I think they've got five hundred and something people already signed up. Very cool. Five hundred and forty seven people are registered. So yeah, hack productivity. Um, we'll drop a I'll drop a link in the Flipboard to it so you can find it. But um, it's pretty cool. It'll be interesting to see what uh, what little examples people come out with for this. Yeah, it will be cool. And so, you, and you say you're having a, you found a little utility that's going to help that helps you with this. That was your that you wanted to share. Yeah. So one of the things I've been struggling with is I'm using the webhooks that webhook support in um, Exchange Online in Office 365 to 
to um, to notify my app when things change in your inbox. And um, there's a couple of tips around those URLs that the webhooks can call. One is that it has to be SSL, and obviously two, that it has to be internet accessible, right? Otherwise, Exchange Online can't call it. And so while you're developing, this is kind of a bit of a pain in the butt, to be honest, because you want to run the your app locally, but have Exchange call you uh, and get those calls. And so um, a colleague of mine, Ted, found or put me onto this app called Finch.io, and uh, I'll drop a, a link in the show notes to it. But it's basically like a, a very easy-to-use reverse proxy for your machine. And so you can basically say, hey, I want to reverse proxy localhost port 3000 or something out onto the internet, and they'll give you a Finch.io uh, DNS, you know, fully qualified domain name. And so when ex- if you put that in the notify URL for Exchange, it'll proxy it to your local machine and you can debug it and catch the requests and things like that. But you can imagine using Finch.io for things like when you're building a mobile app, testing its connectivity to a to an API or debugging the back end of an API, things like that. And um makes it super easy to be able to reverse proxy and publish endpoints from your local machine out to the internet and make them internet accessible for people to hit. They do a free version, which gives you two hours of reverse proxy per month. Or I think you can pay like 10 bucks a month or something like that and uh, get unlimited reverse proxy time. Very cool. That's real, That's very useful. I know you see those things and it's always a pain to have to deploy it and be able to hook up remote debugging to something up in, in a live site or something. That's that's really that's really handy. Yeah, it's pretty pretty nifty utility. Uh, I don't know if I, I'm using it on OS 10. I'm not sure if they've got a um, if they've got a, a web version, but um, I will uh, post a link to it in the show notes. Hmm, that's pretty cool. That's very cool. Yeah. How about you? Do you have a pick? I do. I have um, I have two, and then kind of a fun one that I, I stumbled across. So the first one is. Some people like to listen to music when they work and they like to have, you know, some people like it's a bit of a, I don't know, it's almost like a, you get to be like how people are like foodies with food and you get real specialized with it. Some people get the exact same way with their, um, with their, their music that they listen to. So I tried there. I know there's a, there's stuff called uh, music to code by, by Carl Franklin and um, over at the .NET rocks thing. Yeah. I got his stuff. I tried to listen to it. I'm it's, more e- I know he doesn't like it called this, but it's to me it's more easy listening and it's not my style. So I I like to listen to like techno slash electronica or house or dance music stuff like that. And I have a hard and it, there's radio station on Amazon Music that I listen to that's really good with that. But there's a buddy of mine that uh, a lot of people that are old school SharePoint people are going to be familiar with a guy named Keith Ritchie. Oh yeah, who has. Uh, Software engineer, used to be a um, Microsoft uh, uh, support engineer, yeah. brilliant guy. He is big into this stuff and makes his own music, is a is definitely an artist with it. And uh, he has a whole bunch of stuff you can go listen to. So he's got an album called Ambient Highways, does a lot of digital downloads and stuff, but he's actually started a Kickstarter to have a CD uh, made, a physical CD made of his, uh, of his album called Ambient Highways. It's an award-winning album. So I posted a link to the Kickstarter. I backed it. I bought the digital stuff, but I also backed the project just because I want to see him be successful with it. I It's absolutely phenomenal. He sells it on a subscription basis. So you can get all of his music and all the new stuff he adds. It's great for, if you're a developer, it's great for coding. Yeah, he's a great guy. And uh, actually, I met him many, 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 many years ago when I was working at Microsoft in New Zealand. And he was a, a support escalation engineer or something like that for SharePoint. And um, yeah, great guy. Yeah, it was funny. I, I met him when he was running a case for me when I was back at uh, one of my former jobs. Um, my first job I had when I was doing SharePoint stuff back in 2003, he, we got to level three support with an issue we were having, dealt with him for a while. And then a couple of years later, we ran into each other and it's like, oh my God, you're that guy. Yeah, yeah. He's famous in the in the SharePoint circles. Absolutely, yeah. And so the uh, the other one of the other link or the other pick that I wanted to share was I saw that ReSharper or sorry JetBrains. Oh yes. Post out today is something called Project Rider, and it's a C Sharp IDE, but it's a cross platform C Sharp IDE. Um, they announced it at NDC London uh, today, January the thirteenth, and uh, it looks pretty slick. I'm I'm curious to take a look at it. Yeah, it's definitely. 
some people are going to look at it and say, why would you do this? Why would you even look at this when there's something like Visual Studio out there? Well, number one, it's cross-platform. Someone would then say, well, you know, what other options would you look at? Well, for me, even if you're on Windows, you know, Visual Studio is gigantic. It's a six gig download. So it can be a pretty heavy thing to get. And, you know, maybe you're tired of that. And you want something a little more lightweight. Some people may say, yeah, but what about Visual Studio Code? Well, Visual Studio Code is just the code view. There's no wizards and dialogues and designers and stuff like that. And while it does do cross-platform, it's just the code view. So this thing could have a really nice uh, sweet spot. Um, I'm curious to take a look at it, pull it down, and see where they go with this as a C-sharp uh, editor. So Yeah, I need to install it and have a play around, see what it can do. Yeah, all the screenshots are clearly from a OS Xbox, from a Mac a MacBook. So I'm curious to see what they've done here. The only thing that kind of scares me is I know that most of their stuff is usually Java-based, and I'm not a big fan of Java, but yeah. you know, it's I don't really care anymore. I mean... So much stuff is built in Java. and If they hide it all for you and it doesn't look and feel like that, then... Who cares? Yeah, it does its job. My Git utility or my Git uh, editor, whatever, Git manager uh, tool that I use is all done in Java, and I just I don't care anymore. Purists can, get, can bitch and moan about it, but whatever. <laughs> nice. Hey, so um, we have one more topic to talk about today that we're going to dive into in a little bit more detail. That You have an interesting announcement today around some work you've been doing with Angular. And so um, why don't you talk us through that a little bit and tell us what you've been up to? Absolutely, yeah. So I'll give you the skinny on it. And then uh, if you have any, I'm sure we've talked a little bit about it, but I'm sure you'll have some questions, which will be good for our, our listeners. But um, so back in, I don't know what, September-ish or late in the third, fourth quarter of last year, um, Microsoft released something called the Office UI Fabric. And Office UI Fabric is basically just a set of CSS uh, classes. There is some JavaScript included with it that are done as jQuery plugins, but it's basically a bunch of CSS classes that are used to implement various controls in the Office stack. So from Office 365 to OneDrive to SharePoint to Exchange, these controls are used to, to do things like drop downs, to do things like select boxes and buttons and labels and things to make it look very Office. And so what they did is they released this this design pack um, called the Office UI Fabric that we could use as, as third-party developers to build things that look and feel like Office. And to me, it makes the most sense if you're building a uh, like a SharePoint add-in or if you're building something that's going to live inside of 365 or one of the Office clients. It, it makes sense to use the same design language and the same components that are in the app that you're coming from because... As a developer, one of the things I hate the most is teaching my users or, or um, training my users. This is a familiar experience to your users. They don't have to be retrained. They're used to the same controls. And it, you want your app to feel like it was like part of Outlook or part of SharePoint, right? You don't want to be different. I mean, some people want to do that, but it's just not a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So Microsoft released this. It's not only um, what they call it is not only third party, but first party. So they are using this too. This is actually out of the OneDrive design team. They use this to build their components as well that they use in 365 and other other web properties. So they released this late last year. It's all fine and good. You can use it in your apps. A lot of it's gotten a lot of popularity. It actually is the fastest starred project or popular project on the Office Dev organization on GitHub. So right when it came out, I looked at it and said, "Yeah, but you know what we need is we need Angular directives. We want to be able to just have a special like, let's say I do a, a little uh, do an element." Uh, and have that element show up, be rendered as a text box or as a toggle switch from Office. Yeah. And so what I did is I, I, I set up the project, I set up an organization on GitHub, set up a couple projects, and then it sat dormant for a couple months. And in the last few weeks, we've actually seen a significant amount of uh, uh, activity. So we got a handful of contributors that have jumped into this project. The project's called the NG Office UI Fabric. And what it is, is it is Angular 1 directives, Angular 1.x directives. Specifically, we take a dependency on Angular uh, 1.4.8. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, Angular directives for the Office UI Fabric. And so we've tested everything works with the current version of Office UI Fabric 1.2 and the current version of Angular 1.4.8 and uh, to make sure everything works. We've got today, we just shipped today, January 13th, um, we just shipped our first release. You can get it from NPM. You can get it from Bower. You can get it from NuGet. And it's got eight directives. There's the context menu. There's the drop down, the search box, the spinner, the table with sortable columns. 
text field and the toggle switch. And then we have another directive that is not actually one of the components in the UI fabric called um, icon. So you can just create an icon and give it the name of the icon and it renders out the the i tag with all the different CSS classes that are needed. And the idea here is that if you're building Angular applications, it's supposed to make it easier to use the Office UI fabric than actually having to reference the fabric itself. With this, yeah, you go get it from any of these packages. We take we have dependencies on the UI fabric in Angular, so you pull those in, and then we implement everything out, and um, we implement everything out for you. And so, I encourage everybody to go take a look at it, go check the repo. I would my big ask for everyone is to go to the repo and to number one, to star the, rep- the repository that's there. Yep. If you just go to in- ngofficeuifabric.com, you'll see links to the repo. Please star it. That's the big thing we need because we're trying to get more than 100 stars. Because once we get up to 100 stars, then we can submit it to some- a project called CDNJS so we can actually have a the library published in a CDN and you don't have to host it yourself. Oh, nice. Once you get to 100, is that the deal? Yeah, that, that's their threshold. There's You can make a case if you're lower than that, but because we're so new, there's no way they would do it unless we get 100 stars. And um, man, we've... Yeah, gotcha. Four, our stars have gone up fourfold in the two hours since we've released it. So I think we're in good shape there, but um, I, <laughs> we just want to... We, we definitely need to get going. We're still we're still way away from, uh, from 100. Yeah, no, this is pretty cool. So... I can imagine people uh, wanting to use the Office UI fabric for building, you know, add-ins for Office, even just for building, you know, full-blown web applications that they want to have fit in with the same sort of look and feel. Not necessarily the same layout, but the same, using some of the same controls that um, Office 365 use, and um, and so it's nice. Uh, obviously, with Angular being an extremely popular framework, being able to kind of do it the Angular way is um, is is really slick being able to integrate with your uh with your application so i hope it all takes off for you man it's um it's gonna be interesting to see uh how the community picks up on it and um obviously material from google has got a bunch of momentum and um but you got to make an app look like a like a googly app right um whereas if you wanted to fit it in with the microsoft and office 365 kind of look and feel this is the way to go make your apps uh, sit alongside Office 365 really, really nice. So, yeah, I will definitely be taking a look at it and uh, and look forward to more controls and ultimately Angular 2 support down the line and all that sort of stuff. So, rad. Yeah, so today it's just Angular 1. We're focusing on Angular 1.4. We wanted to do that because we know that the vast majority of the developers out there are still using Angular 1. They're not using Angular 2. But the goal is, is that once this is done, we'll move, switch over and we'll start doing the Angular 2 ones as well. It's a completely community-driven project. We um, are are following the road that was paved by the Angular Material team and building their implementation of the Google Design Language Material uh, for Angular um, in terms of how they did their naming conventions, how they structured it, the decisions they made. And we've, we've made some pretty key decisions. So things like today, the Office UI fabric is just CSS, but they provide some JavaScript libraries that are essentially jQuery plugins to give you functionality. So for example, when you want to, when you click on the, the for the dropdown or for a select box, the way it opens up, that's done using J, a jQuery plugin. So the Office UI Fabric, this, it, they, the JavaScript is like sample JavaScript if you're using jQuery. And so if you want to do it the way that they're showing you, you have to take a dependency on jQuery. But when you're doing stuff with Angular, you really don't, you want to try not to use jQuery because they're different. You're kind of doing two different things, right? You're, it's, jQuery is going to be more of manipulating the page where Angular is more, you're using data binding to let the framework render out different things on the page for you. Yeah. So Angular does have an implementation of jQuery inside of it. It's called jQuery Lite to do some of the selection, but what we want to do is we want to make sure that you don't have to use jQuery. And so any control that the Office UI Fabric has that requires some JavaScript, for example, the dropdown control, any control that would require that, that has some sort of control there, we don't require you to use jQuery. We actually have rewritten the JavaScript as native Angular code um, so that you only need our library. The only the only two dependencies you really need for this is number one, you need, J- you need Angular, and number two, you need the CSS from the Office UI fabric. And we've we've had some discussions on should we kind of 
package up the CSS from the Office UI fabric, should we include that in the library? We're not really sure. I mean, that's something we'll kind of look at going forward, but um, just to kind of save on a dependency. But right now you're going to reference, at a minimum, you're going to reference uh, four files in your HTML. You're going to reference Angular um, JS. You're going to reference ng Office UI Fabric JS, and you're going to reference the two CSS files from um, the Office UI Fabric. Slick, slick. It'll be great to see apps starting to get built like this and uh, this look and feel, and then um, directives to to easily integrate them with your Angular app. So um, it sounds like Google are keen on this as well, by the sounds of it. Yeah, they are actually. We've um, I've talked to uh, I talked to some of the guys over the Angular team at Google, and they are very they're very interested in it. They they love the competition. They or not the competition. I shouldn't say that. They love another option. So, I mean, you, you this design language thing. There essentially there are there are two mature options. We would be the third immature option or new option, I guess you could say. Right. You can use Bootstrap, and I think everybody's familiar with what Bootstrap is. It's a bunch of CSS a bunch of CSS classes that help you do buttons and stuff in a in a, a seamless way. There's a project called UI Bootstrap, which is basically Bootstrap for Angular, and it's a bunch of Angular directives that help you um, that let you, that use Bootstrap to skin your app. The other option is Angular Material, and that is implementing Google's Material Design Language with Angular controls and classes and stuff. And so, and it's done specifically for Angular. And then we have ours. Now, there's there's all three of them are three very different fields. So. If you want something to feel like an Android app or like the Google design, the Google web apps and stuff, Angular Material is the way to go. I mean, it make, that just makes sense. Right. If you want to use Bootstrap, if you're familiar with that, UI Bootstrap, great option. But if you're building an app, an Angular app, and it's going to live in the Microsoft ecosystem, to me, it makes sense to use the Office UI Fabric. So the Google guys are very interested in this. They're very, they're, they've been giving a lot of encouragement with this. I got to give it to them. They, you know, they've been kind of like, hey, are you doing this for Angular 2? It's like, we're going to. We're going to focus on this first, and then we're going to do yeah. uh, Angular 2. We're going to focus on this one first. It makes sense for the context of your app, right? Like, you want it to fit in. You want it to – you don't want it to be jarring and, and weird. So um, having choices like that is great. Yeah. So the, the, it's cool. We got we got six guys that are involved in this, I mean, aside from myself. Some of them uh, you guys are going to be familiar with. Uh, Wallet Mastercards is uh, one. He's spent a lot of time with me on the Office, on the, uh, office Generator, the Yo! Office Generator. And then there are four other names here that I want to give a shout out to because they've got they've been very very helpful and doing a lot of work here. No particular order, and I'm going to sorry for messing up the names here. I'm going to do my best. Um, they're all listed in my blog post that we've got on the in Flipboard. It's a uh, Sergey Sergeev, Ronald Oldengram, Jersey Kospek, and uh, Jigar Gandhi. So those five guys, I mean, or five guys are. They've been awesome. They've all contributed um, some of the different directives, and they've all got stuff checked out to work on some of the additional ones. So we got a lot of room for help if anybody wants to jump in and get involved in this. Would love to have you. We've got a if you if you're interested in checking it out. It's actually some of the cool techie stuff with this that some devs may be interested in. Everything's oh, we're doing everything in TypeScript, no JavaScript except for the demos. Everything's done in TypeScript. Everything's got you know full code coverage. I think we have 99 percent of our sort of our lines are being tested. All of it's automated testing. All of it's automated build testing and stuff. Wait, hold on a second. You're doing it the right way? We're doing it the right way. It's awesome. Wow. It's awesome. Nicely done. Every time you do a pull request, it submits it to Travis. Travis does all the, uh, it vets the code. It actually t- runs all the tests. If it fails, you're a bad person. We, got, <laughs> we, we, we jump all over you. We're actually doing, we're actually using the module syntax too from like the latest version of JavaScript and TypeScript. So we're using what's called the um, external names or the external module syntax. Mm. And today browsers don't really, most browsers don't support that. So we're doing all of our module loading using something called Webpack, which is really cool because it figures out all the dependencies and sucks everything in for us. Gotcha. Then you don't have to write your app in a, in a different way or anything. It just, it makes it easy. But what's cool is like, hey, if you look at this and say, yeah, I'd be interested in getting and trying this out, not just from the demo site that where you can go see all the directives. If you just go to ngofficeuifabric.com. Um, but let's say you want to, I'm, I'm interested in contributing. What's it like? We actually have an article in our repo called The Minimal Path to Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, That's pretty cool. uh, it's, it, I, it's not an original idea. I heard somebody else actually use this. I'm trying to remember where who used it, but it's the idea is like, hey, I'm a dev and I want to try it out. So Show me the quick way. Yeah, so there's two dependencies you have to do. You have to install TypeScript and a utility called TSD, which is just the thing that grabs um, type definitions for TypeScript. 
you install those two things, and then we walk you through, here's how you clone the repository, here's how you compile everything, uh, here's how you compile everything, here's how you run all the tests, here's how you vet all the code, here's how you look at the code coverage, here's how you build the library in debug mode, here's how you do it in production mode, and then here's how, now go ahead and open up one of these demos, and voila, you can see everything working. So yeah, gotcha. the whole process takes, honest to God, takes about five to ten, five to ten minutes to get through the entire thing if you walk through it, so really quick you can get up and running and um yeah if you're interested in contributing jump in take a look at it uh come to the site we have a slack network you can jump in and we can start our slack team we can jump in and ask questions and see all the activity going on and we, you know claim one of the ones that's out there claim one of the open issues that's out there uh to build a, a directive and hey have at it build one and get your name on it cool man cool definitely check it out there's a link to it in the uh and Flipboard, and um, I've already started the repo, so you got my vote. Awesome. Thank you very much. And if you wanted to hear more about it, too, I actually was uh, interviewed uh, in an episode that comes out today on uh, on January the 13th. I think it's episode 76 on a podcast called The Adventures in Angular. Uh, we will uh, – I'll link to that in the, in the Flipboard when it actually gets published. But I actually talked to those guys about doing office add-ins um, with Angular and – um, the state of Angular within the 365 and Microsoft space and also using the what the Office UI fabric is and stuff. So if you're interested in hearing about that, that's another like hour-long discussion with uh, the likes of Ward Bell, Joe Eames, John Papa, Lucas Rubuki, and Charles Maxwood. Very cool. Very cool. I will uh, I will definitely take a listen to that. Cool. Nice. Well, good show, AC. Thanks for uh, thanks for jumping on the phone and I and, uh, hope everybody got something out of this. We've got some news Go into the hackathon if you're if you're so inclined. Go try out. Uh, it's actually meetfinch.com, not finch.io. Different site. <laughs> so meetfinch.com uh, for the reverse proxy pick, and uh, and obviously try out these um, these new Office UI Fabric Angular directives. Awesome. Very cool, man. Excellent. Cheers, man. Yeah. Cheers. If you have a question for us, go to microsoftcloudshow.com forward slash questions, where you can submit it as text or record it as a wave or MP3 and provide a link so we can play your question on the show. You can subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for Microsoft Cloud Show or via RSS at microsoftcloudshow.com where you'll also find a full transcript and show notes of each episode. You can also find us on Facebook searching for Microsoft Cloud Show or on Twitter at MS Cloud Show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.